Just before we get started, I do want to say that this video is brought to you by Policy Genius. If you have family members who depend on your income, you need life insurance. It's kind of just a fact. That's where Policy Genius comes in, but more about them in a bit. Hong Kong is a city of 7.5 million people at the mouth of the Pearl River Delta in southern China. The dense city has long been an economic hub for South China, yet it's also part of one of the largest city clusters in the world. Known as the Greater Bay Area or the Pearl River Delta region, Hong Kong and nearby Guangdong province combine to host a population of almost 70 million people in an area about 56,000 square kilometers big. That's more than the population of the U.S. UK in a territory smaller than the US state of West Virginia. The three largest economies in the area belong to three neighboring cities, Hong Kong, Shenzhen, and Guangzhou, each with a local economy of over $300 billion of GDP. These cities have been connected throughout their existence, but that connecting took a lot of valuable time until recently. Local authorities built the Guangzhou-Shenzhen-Hong Kong Express rail link to cut down on that time. The most critical section of the project became known as the Hong Kong XRL. From an economic and urban mobility perspective, the rail made perfect sense. But as the governments moved forward with their plans, Hong Kongers voiced their concerns with the project. It was overpriced, behind schedule, and required the destruction of natural and residential areas. But the most significant problem was a political one. But look, whether you're for or against this rail line, there's no question that its scale was ambitious and in many ways the project was successful. It's now among the most expensive infrastructure projects in Hong Kong's history. It's called the Hong Kong Express Rail Link. So let's get started. In 1910, while Hong Kong was under British rule, the city remains one of the most influential factors in China's economy. 130 kilometers to the north, Guangzhou, or Canton, was growing into an important city in its own right, so the Chinese and the British governments built the first rail link between the two cities. Previously, the easiest way to travel from Hong Kong to Guangzhou was over water through the Pearl River Delta, but this new connection allowed for much easier border crossings. The single rail required collaboration between the two countries as China operated the portion within their territory and the British the line within theirs. The line was shut down after the Communist Revolution of 1949, finally reopening in 1979. By that time, Guangdong Province, the area surrounding Hong Kong, had a population of almost 60 million people. Cities like Shenzhen and Dongguang were popping up in the spaces between Hong Kong and Guangzhou and essentially sustaining their growth through economic relationships with these larger cities. Between 1990 and 2000, Guangdong would add another 20 million inhabitants. This is all to say that the existing rail connections were overloaded with passengers and connecting the region's transport networks could reap huge financial rewards. In fact, the Chinese government sought to connect the entire country with high-speed rail links. The plan would require decades to complete, but it's still in progress today. In the south, the local governments collaborated to announce the Guangzhou Shenzhen Hong Kong Rail Express Link, or XRL, in 1994. With the United Kingdom handing Hong Kong back to China in 1997, the rail became a key factor in culturally, politically, and economically integrating Hong Kong into China. Through this rail link, passengers could ride from Hong Kong to Guangzhou in less than an hour. They could even travel to Beijing without ever leaving a transit station. With this broad goal in mind, in-depth planning and development began. The decade from 1997 to 2007 was marked by disagreements over how to build this new express rail link. Initially, the planners latched onto the idea of building a maglev train, the kind of system that uses so-called magnetic levitation to reduce friction and propel trains at breakneck speeds. In Shanghai, construction on the world's fastest maglev track had already begun. The technology had clear advantages in Hong Kong, as XRL's directors sought to cut travel time throughout the region in half. Maglev would do more than that, reducing the time to less than half an hour between Guangzhou and Hong Kong. But it was also costly. 
based on available funding, pursuing maglev in Hong Kong would limit the project to a single rail corridor. Instead, in 2000, a new plan was put forward to build non-maglev high-speed rail. This cheaper plan would allow for six distinct corridors, each one branching off toward a different regional station on the mainland. Passengers could still commute between Hong Kong and Guangzhou in less than an hour, but for a fraction of the cost. Estimates placed the budget from between 130 to 170 billion Hong Kong dollars, or about 26 billion US dollars in today's money. The final stage of planning revolved around determining routes and locations for new stations. The line would include a single stop in Hong Kong at the West Kowloon Terminus, a station built purely to serve the new rail development. The Hong Kong section would be 26 kilometers long, connecting with the mainland at the Futian Station in Shenzhen. This trip would take just 14 minutes. The 142-kilometer journey to Guangzhou would require 47 minutes, well below that one-hour goal. Economists estimated that the track would add billions of dollars in long-term growth to Hong Kong's GDP. The line could serve more than 100,000 daily riders commuting to and from the iconic port city. Everything seemed to be proceeding smoothly. But as Hong Kong's government prepared to approve the project for development, a small minority of Hong Kongers began to speak out against it and they made their voices heard. Now, we'll return to Hong Kong in just a moment, but first, here's a quick word from today's video sponsor, Policy Genius. Look, it's not breaking news to tell you that absolutely nobody likes to think about life insurance, but the reality is that it's an important layer of protection for many families, especially single income households. Fortunately, there's Policy Genius and its award winning policy options, ranked number one by Forbes. Whether you're putting off your purchase or you just never really thought about it, Policy Genius is the team you want to check in with. This is a third party marketplace that works for you, not for the insurance companies, so you can trust their licensed experts are going to give you solid and unbiased advice. Life insurance premiums might seem like a financial drain, but you could save $1,300 or more per year by using Policy Genius to compare life insurance policies. So if you're interested, head to policygenius.com forward slash megaprojects to get started, and in just a few minutes you can work out how much coverage you need and compare personalized quotes to find your best price. When you're ready to apply, the Policy Genius team will handle the paperwork and scheduling for free. You could save 50% or more on life insurance by comparing quotes with Policy Genius and getting covered now locks in your rate. Over the course of a 10 or 20 year policy, those savings absolutely add up. Best of all, eligible applicants can get covered in as little as one week. So head to policygenius.com forward slash mega projects to get started. You'll be glad you did, because when it comes to insurance, it's nice to get it right. Let's get back to Hong Kong. By 2009, the Hong Kong government was ready to approve the new rail line and begin construction before year's end. In-depth studies of the project's potential costs placed the construction budget at just over 40 billion Hong Kong dollars, or 5 billion USD. It was expected to generate about 10 billion US dollars over the next 50 years, by no means a profit machine, but as a public service, any profit was seen as a positive. The government pointed to other benefits as well. They would allow Hong Kong to maintain its position as a commercial and transit hub for the region, and perhaps even boost tourism in the city. With nearby Shenzhen developing into China's tech capital, the economic partnership and ease of transport throughout the area became more important than ever. But in November of 2009, something changed in the public's perception of their new rail project. A group of a thousand people gathered near the city council buildings to protest the scheme. The following month, when the city's legislative council met to approve funding, a group of 2,000 people demonstrated outside the building and funding was put on hold. By January, the largest group of protesters reached more than 10,000 people. The group laid forth several valid concerns. First, while tracks in the mainland would be funded with existing government revenues, the expansion in Hong Kong called for increased taxes on the locals. Given its capacity of 100,000 daily riders, the protesters argued that the new rail would only benefit a small portion of the city's economic elite. Furthermore, most of the daily commuters would be traveling into Hong Kong for work. When Hong Kongers used the rail, they would more likely be traveling for pleasure, and the existing rail line already served that purpose perfectly. Their point was clear. Hong Kongers didn't want to pay for something that would primarily benefit people outside their city. But the concerns weren't purely economic. In the years leading up to the XRL's approval, the Hong Kong government had demolished two important historic sites, Star Ferry Pier and the Queen's Pier. These structures memorialized critical events in Hong Kong's history, but they were also beloved public spaces. The city government's move to reclaim the waterfront lands for more profitable infrastructure development symbolized the leadership's willingness to make the city less livable in the name of economic expansion. Many pro-conservation demonstrators who fought for the two peers noticed the similarities with the XRL project too. 
building West Kowloon Terminus called for the destruction of several similarly historic areas. Chow Yuan San Village, a small but historic community of about 500 Hong Kongers, would need to be dismantled for the project to move forward. Other neighborhoods that had somehow escaped the rampant noise pollution of the bustling metropolis would now have their ears assaulted by the speeding trains many times a day. Nevertheless, these concerns were only enough to rile up a relatively small group of like-minded people. The protesters gathered 10,000 signatures on a petition to cancel the project, but it made little difference. By January the 16th, 2010, the rail was approved and funding was secured. While approving the Hong Kong XRL was a long and arduous political process, the same could not be said about the mainland. The Shenzhen and Guangzhou sections of the XRL were practically complete when work began on the Hong Kong section. Futian Station in South Shenzhen, the last terminal before crossing into Hong Kong, was completed in 2011. But now the mainland began a waiting game with the long, oft-delayed construction in Hong Kong. One reason for the delays was that almost all of the rail in Hong Kong was subterranean. Tunneling is an expensive and labor-intensive process, but boring machines sped up that work immensely. For Hong Kong XRL, construction crews used state-of-the-art boring machines that could be dismantled before removing them from the tunnels. But in March of 2014, a three-month storm blasted the city, flooding the tunnels and damaging the expensive instruments. Frequent delays and cost overruns ensued par for the course for such a project. Finally, on September 22, 2018, the entire Guangzhou Shenzhen Hong Kong XRL was inaugurated. Hong Kong's chief executive stood within the brand new West Kowloon terminus, leading a grand opening ceremony. The station was eye-catching, modern, and massive. As the only XRL station in the city, it marks the beginning and end of the 26-kilometer-long Hong Kong section. The terminus stands boldly above the shoreline of Victoria Harbour, offering sweeping views of the magnificent Hong Kong skyline. The building has smooth, steep curbs, many of which host large green spaces for locals to relax before entering the bustling terminal. West Kowloon Terminus stands 25 meters tall and covers 400,000 square meters of floor space. The rail line actually failed to achieve its goal of delivering passengers from Guangzhou to Hong Kong in less than an hour. Instead, the 142-kilometer trip takes about an hour and 18 minutes. Trips from Hong Kong to Shenzhen take less than 15. Despite the delays and cost overruns, the project was mostly hailed as a success, but for many Hong Kongers, it had become a daunting symbol of impending change. The final, most hotly contested controversy of the Hong Kong XRL began about a year before the track was opened. It stemmed from a small portion of West Kowloon Terminus's 400,000 square meter floor space. The station included something called a joint immigration checkpoint. Since the train crosses a semi-national border, travelers have to go through an immigration process. This checkpoint allows travelers from Hong Kong to the mainland to go through that process before boarding the train, allowing quicker disembarkation across the border. In Hong Kong, this meant that Chinese law took precedent over Hong Hong Kong law within much of the train station and on the trains. This revelation led to widespread protests throughout Hong Kong as the city's residents argued that Beijing was using the rail as a means to expand their authority into what was technically a semi-autonomous region. Critics called the station and the rail line a Trojan horse a covert means of politically infiltrating the city. Yet the Chinese government actually had solid political cover. After all, joint immigration checkpoints exist along many international borders. American immigration officials have offices in Toronto and Vancouver, expanding U.S. jurisdiction into a tiny sliver of Canada. The U.K., France, and Belgium have similar setups. Even in mainland China, on the outskirts of Shenzhen, Hong Kong's government has its own immigration checkpoint. Yet there's one key difference. In the other examples, the countries are seen as equal parties as each negotiating with the other from equal standing. In China, the mainland sees itself as the ultimate authority over Hong Kong. Critics argue that the Chinese government saw the rail as a first step in expanding further into the semi-autonomous region. Either way, the line opens in 2018. Over the next few years, it operated below capacity, never averaging more than 70,000 daily users in a month. In January of 2020, the entire section was shut down due to the COVID pandemic. Whether it will ever reach the heights that were predicted for it remains to be seen. In the meantime, authorities are looking into speeding up the train, mainly focusing on cutting-edge vehicle technology. Perhaps one day they will finally achieve their goal of moving between Hong Kong and Guangzhou in less than an hour. So I really hope you found that video interesting. If you did, please do smash that like button below. Don't forget to subscribe. Please do check out Policy Genius. Don't put it off. There's a link below. And thank you for watching.